Welcome back to special coverage of the January 6th committee, focusing today on the extremist groups that attacked the Capitol and their ties to Trump allies Roger Stone and Mike Flynn. We'll also see tape testimony by Pat Cipollone, White House counsel for former President Trump, who committee members tell us corroborated almost everything, his words, almost everything previous witnesses, including Cassidy Hutchinson, said. That's from Jamie Raskin to Ali Vitale. And joining us now, former senior FBI official and U.S. Attorney Chuck Rosenberg, former assistant FBI director Frank Figluzzi, and former RNC chairman Michael Steele. So, Chuck, so we know that Roger Stone and Mike Flynn both you know, were in touch with these extremists. Mike Flynn is a you know, former you know, general. How, how that is possible is for us to someday understand. But they were in touch with these extremist leaders. They talked to Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, and were, you know, trying to get these groups worked in with the president. But they, they never, we don't know that they made the connection. We don't know. I think you're right. It's a really important question, Andrea. Right? There's a difference between something that's correlated and something that's causal. You know, uh, smoking and drinking alcohol might be correlated. People do both. Uh, but smoking doesn't cause drinking. Uh, but smoking causes cancer. That's causal. And so what I'm looking for today is causality. In other words, whether the organizers cause these things to happen. And maybe another important question along those lines, Andrea, whether they also funded it, right? This costs money to come to Washington and stay in hotels and organize groups. Where does the money come from, uh, which I think is also... Uh, yeah, we haven't heard very much about the money, but how important is it to make that connection to Donald Trump himself? Well, it's important to make the connection. Whether it goes all the way up to Donald Trump is not something you or I know yet, right? So what prosecutors and agents try to do is make those connections and see how high it goes. I think as a prosecutor, it's dangerous to pick a target and then look for facts. Uh, rather, follow the facts, follow the law, and see where they lead you. That's what Merrick Garland has said over and over again. If they go to Donald Trump, so be it. And if they don't, so be it. Katie? All right, let's talk about who um, showed up that day and what they were carrying. We heard Frank from Pete Williams talking about DOJ filings, about the level of weaponry uh, that was in Washington, D.C. that day, carried by those who stormed the Capitol. Uh, we also heard from Donnell Harvin, who said that they anticipated this. They had heard chatter about this. And last week, we heard from Cassidy Hutchinson, who said that Donald Trump was told that the people in his crowd at his rally were armed that they were armed, the ones that couldn't get in were armed. They didn't want to go through the metal detectors. He said, let them in anyway. They're not here to hurt me. And then he urged those folks uh, to march to the Capitol. When you're going to be watching these committee hearings and you're going to look for that link between Donald Trump and the extremists, what will you be watching out for? Well, as we've just heard from uh, Andrea and Chuck, that dotted line needs to become solid for so many people in our country to be convinced of the causality connection. So we heard a lot after 9-11 terror attacks about connecting dots. That needs to happen today. And so one of those ways to connect those is to actually show that evidence. How many times and by whom was the former president told, we have armed people in this crowd? And then how many times and in what way did he say, I, I don't really care, they're not here to hurt me? And then this whole issue of Secret Service telling him he can't proceed to the Capitol, and then him insisting that he wants to. What, what was that all about? And then with regard to who showed up that day, it's not just random people who might have been armed, but we need to hear in detail the extent to which domestic terror groups like Oath Keepers and Proud Boys were prepared for battle and planned to breach. For example, we are now hearing about military ordnance, grenades, uh, the stockpiling of weapons in hotels around the D.C. Beltway. But, you know, one of the other things that struck me was there was a month's worth of food supplies stocked around D.C. Think about preparing for a battle so protected that you would need a month of food to do it. That is uh, amazing to me and should be amazing to people who hear it today. That is incredible. I had not heard that. Uh, Frank, thanks for that. Michael, let's talk about whether this is breaking through. There's a lot of talk about Republicans hardening and not wanting to hear it. But there was a New York Times poll out today, a New York Times Santa College poll, showing that half of Republicans say that they'd like somebody else to run in 2024. They would vote for somebody else. 
half they still say they'd vote for Donald Trump, but half. I wonder if there is something about these hearings, something about the reminder of January 6th and all that happened up to it, all that happened during it, and then all that happened after that is making some in the Republican Party say, hey, listen, this is just too much. I'd rather somebody come in with a blank slate. Yeah, I think there there is that sort of loosening of the the vice grip that the president has. Uh, although I don't I, I don't know if that translates um, when you get into the fall. If this if these hearings are still underway, yeah, that's going to be a, a real sort of uh, moment for Republicans to to have to confront as they hunker down around candidates. Um, you know, that are going to be on the ballot supporting Donald Trump, supporting the big lie. And if the committee is effective, uh, as it has been up to this point, in creating the narrative in which people, you know, walk away, uh, Katie, wanting someone to be accountable. And I think that's what you're seeing in some of those numbers. It's not so much that, oh, my God, you know, I didn't realize. They realize, but now they realize, yeah, someone's got to pay for this. Someone's got to be accountable. And that speak to, speaks to the effectiveness um, and it certainly goes to what my two friends and colleagues have just said about what we sh what we should be looking for today, what we what we need to hear today, to setting that narrative in stone for voters uh, as they sort of round out their summer. Uh, because remember, a lot of people didn't think folks would be paying attention to this. Remember at the beginning of this, everybody, oh yeah, this you know, and no one's going to really care. That was the GOP standard line. You know, I'm not watching this. I don't care until guess what their voters started viewing. And when Fox started turn, tuning in, um, and that told me in that moment, there was something about these hearings that was beginning to make a difference. We're seeing it in some of the polling. We'll see how it really settles when votes have to actually start voting and start thinking about not just 2022, but 2024. Yeah, and that's exactly when you started seeing Donald Trump really going after Liz Cheney and some of the other uh, act, people who are active, the Republicans who have, he thinks, you know, abandoned him and have participated yep. in this and supported it, in fact. And Chuck, one of the other things is this Pat Cipollone testimony. What we're going to see today from him, I think, is just be so important, not just because of Cassidy Hutchinson and corroborating, as he says, you know, almost all of what, or as we've been told, rather, almost all of what she said. But Jared Kushner, here is... The, the family itself, the Trump family being interviewed, cooperating with the committee as far as it went in their testimony. Let's watch what he had to say about this White House counsel. Jared, uh, are you aware of um, instances where uh, Pat Cipollone threatened to resign? I, I kind of, uh, like I said, my interest at that time was on trying to get as many pardons done. Uh, and I know that, you know, he was always... To him and the team were always saying, oh, we're going to resign. We're not going to be here if this happens, if that happens. So I kind of took it up to just be whining, to be honest with you. Just be whining. Well, th there's so much packed in that brief statement by Jared Kushner. First of all, he throws off that he was trying to get pardons for all of these people. You know, is that, that's a casual thing. But the fact is that Pat Cipollone, while a loyal Republican, a rock rib conservative Republican, you know, the defender of the president in the second impeachment trial, successful defender in the Senate in impeachment trial of the president, he was warning him against illegal acts. And so that speaks to whatever credibility he has going into these, this testimony that he gave last week. You know, Andrea, I'm not given to strong reactions, but I had a strong reaction when I heard that. I've, if you take an, a set of things that are remarkably dumb and a set of things that are remarkably arrogant and you look at the intersection of those two sets, you're going to find Jared Kushner standing right there. It's absolutely remarkable to me um, that a White House counsel would tell you uh, that he and his people are considering resigning if certain things happen or don't happen or certain, certain things are said or not said, and that you would consider it whining. Um, it is a window onto his soul, and it is not a very pretty view. And in fact, that he would then say as sort of a throwaway line, I was so busy worrying about pardons, which is actually the purview of the White House counsel, not 
an aide who is also the president's son-in-law. You're right. We've ignored that part of it, and it's a good point. Um, it is not really his purview, although from reports, everything seemed to be his purview. Uh, but if the White House counsel tells you there's a problem, Andrea, you should listen. Indeed. Katie. Chuck Rosenberg, thank you very much. Good advice for all of us. Uh, Michael, <laughs> thank you as well. And also Frank.